So I'm really excited to announce that today I have my little sister. Let me bring her in. Hello. Um, so this is my baby sister, Gina, aka Gina Bug. She said that was her most authentic name that she could put on the internet. Um, here today to talk about her experiences being a caregiver to her disabled husband as someone who is also disabled, um, someone who struggles with chronic physical as well as mental illness, um, someone who's a mother and someone who's also working class, someone who has to work full time to help support her family. She's been through a lot and is going through, you know, currently is still going through a lot. And she wanted to come on today to share her experiences and share what she's learned you know, through her journey so far. And I, of course, was so stoked to have my, my little baby on the show. So Gina, Hi. why don't you tell us about what happened to your husband and kind of set the stage for what you want to talk about today? Okay, okay. So, so May, 9th, May 9th, 2019. 2019. My husband, my husband woke me up woke in, the, me middle up in the middle of the night. He slapped, he slapped, my, slapped chest my chest and grabbed, and grabbed my, shirt. my shirt. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what? 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 <laughs> and he was and complaining he was about, complaining being, about busy. being busy. And that, and that happens, happens when, he, when he, he doesn't get, he doesn't enough, get enough sleep. Enough sleep. So, so I told him, I told him just go, back, just to go bed. back to bed. And then when he woke up a couple hours later, he asked me to um text his bosses and say that he couldn't make it into work he wasn't feeling well which is very out of the norm um we both agree that as grown-ups you do your own call outs you don't have someone do it for you unless it's an emergency so um i ran to walmart grabbed him some ginger ale and some crackers like the basic i'm nauseous don't feel good and uh when he wasn't getting any better uh, I told him, all right, let's go to the hospital. Like, let's get you checked out. Something's wrong. And he said he felt like he was going to be sick. So I held him up and I was walking him to the bathroom. And do you remember those juicy juice cardboard box juice boxes? And like when you crush them in the middle, how like they crumpled into that shape. It's exactly what it looked like. He just crumbled. He collapsed. I physically caught him. Um, he went unconscious. His whole left side curled up. And then when he came to, he wasn't making any sense. He was talking, but all the words, they weren't real words. And then he made the motion that he was going to get sick. So I propped him up and I held him while he threw up. And then uh, we called 911. Um, at the time, mom and Sonny had come to visit. Because two months before this happened, Sonny went through emergency quadruple bypass surgery. Mm. And um, he almost died and he had never met Parker. So they were out on vacation so he could meet her. And 36 hours later, John had a stroke. Wow. Um, so talk about that being the luckiest part of the event happening when it did. Um, but so ambulance came and got him. I followed him to we have a local like small emergency room down the street now and when we got there he kept getting sick every time they tried to lay him down he got sick again he said everything was spinning his head was killing him everything felt off so they brought in the computer <laughs> with a neurologist on the screen and you know he's asking have you been sick you know do you suffer from severe allergies? Have you had a flu or a cold lately? And it was all no. And um, he's like, well, here's, here's the deal. You either have an undetected extreme ear infection that's knocking your system off, or you had a stroke. Wow. So, and that was really hard because I know you know John and like you've met him enough to like understand, um, but I'll explain him more to your audience. Um, He's, before his stroke, he was a very loving, uh, patient, funny guy. He was a wonderful multitasker. Um, you know, I always made the joke that he was my gay husband because he had a lot of feminine qualities where I typically have a lot of more what you would call masculine qualities. And, you know, we had that balance. But um, he had never been scared of death. 
<clears throat> that was never something that freaked him out. That's always been like my huge fear. Mm -hmm. um, and he was always the big, strong, cool, collected guy. So fast forward back to the first part of the hospital and he had a male nurse who was looking at him and he's like, man, are you all right? And John just started crying. He's like, I don't know what's wrong with me, but something isn't right. So the guy sat there literally rubbing his feet, like telling him, hey, man, it's okay. And they cried together. So that was, you know, that was my first cue that something was catastrophically wrong because that's just not him. So that hospital's smaller, so they didn't have everything they needed to test him. So they transported us to Portsmouth, so a bigger hospital. Mm -hmm. And they started running the tests there. Um, there was a lot of back and forth about what had happened because he didn't have an active brain bleed. And since he was so young, he kind of got looked over um, because he could make his fingers touch. There was some weakness, but no one was really like wanting to call the duck a duck because he was so young. So we went through a lot of testing. Um, he got you know, the ultrasounds, echograms, MRIs, CAT scans, uh, spinal tap, like every, every test. And then they finally brought in the PT, the lead PT and OT for the hospital. So physical therapist, occupational therapist. So she asked him what he did for a living. And he's like, you know, at the time he was working for Guitar Center. And so she, you know, she's the first person to like get to know him and asked, you know, are you a musician? He's a, I'm a guitarist. I'm a drummer. I've been playing for, you know, 15 to 20 years, depending on the instrument. So she goes, okay, we'll put your fingers together for me then. So he was able, where's my hand, to do this, right? Mm -hmm. But that was as fast as he could go. Mm. And she's like, obviously there's a problem. If you've been picking guitar for that long, like you should be okay. So then she tried getting him on his feet, which was really hard for him. It took like 10 minutes to get him out of the bed because everything just kept moving. And she tried getting him to stand on his tiptoes and his left foot would just not go. So she started seeing the immediate deficits and I'm like, I'm really concerned because this doctor wanted to get him out. You know, he was talking, he was responding, he was able to do the basic touch test. And I looked at her, I go, there's something really wrong. Like this isn't him. Like as soon as we were in the hospital, he wanted the lights off. He didn't want the TV on. He didn't want to listen to music. He didn't want to FaceTime with the kids. Like he just, mm -hmm. nothing, just completely disconnected. And then his tone, his tone went flat. Everything came out like this. And I'm like, there's something like, it's not my husband. Like there's something off. So that lady was a badass and she put her foot down to the doctor and she's like, I will go to your boss if I have to. If he was a single person, you would not be able to send him home. He can't make it up a flight of stairs. You're not allowing, he's restricted, couldn't go to the bathroom by himself. He had a, me, and if like I had to go run to be with the kids, he had to call a nurse to get help because he was a huge fall risk. So we, I was able to stay with him the whole time. I was very lucky and it was because mom and Sonny were there and um, my best friend in the whole wide world, she's a kid's godmom. Um, she went and taught them their routine and stuff and like made sure the kids were okay. Um, and she was a sweetheart. She came to visit me every day in the hospital. And I got the, hey, did you eat today? And I'm like, yes. And she goes, good, you're gonna fucking eat again. And she would just <laughs> sit and like force me to eat with her, which, you know, was amazing. Cause I dropped like 20 pounds while the first couple months of just being so stressed out. So he got a neurologist in there. His name is Zach and he's still his neurologist to this day. He's the most phenomenal human. Um, like he always makes sure to make our appointment the last appointment of the day. And he makes sure that I'm there with him so we can discuss the real life. Cause this is the thing I'm going to give everyone a warning on. First off, I didn't know anything about strokes. Okay. I thought I knew left side goes weird, right? That's like the face drop. That's, I just thought it was mainly physical, but the reality of a stroke is it hits your brain and it causes an unknown, unexplainable, un like just, you have no idea where it's going to go. 
brain injury. You don't know what's going to get knocked. And so we, after all this hunting and grueling, and I did a lot of fighting and advocating, we have a team that doesn't just care about the medical aspect of the stroke. They care about the personal part of it as well. How does he do with the kids? How does he do with himself? How do you do, how does he do in a marriage situation? It wasn't just about the clinical, you had a stroke, let's get you walking and talking. So he was in PT, OT and speech almost immediately out of the hospital. We were in the hospital for 11 days. Um, he came home with a cane. He couldn't open doors. He couldn't open up bottles. Um, he couldn't stand in the shower. We had to get him a shower chair. Um, we had to get like all new pillows, all new everything, you know, all of his medications. Um, they put him on a diet restriction, even though like we ended up finding out it didn't have anything to do with his diet. Oh, let me paint this. I forgot to say this. My husband is a six foot two man. Um, at the time of his stroke, he was 185 pounds. He was going to the gym three to five days a week and he has never tried anything ever, like never tried alcohol or drugs or anything. Like what, you know, you epitomize as a really healthy person. So um, after a lot of testing and retesting, um, cardiologists, pulmonologists, neurologists, PT, OT speech, we found out what happened is he has a hole in his pulmonary shunt. So the vein system that goes to his heart has a hole. And then he also has a prolapsed mitral valve on the inside of his heart. So the valve that's responsible for circulating the blood into oxygenated and unoxygenated regurgitates. So his wow. blood wasn't filtering properly. So it pulled up at the top clot and the clot just happened to go. So the shittiest part about all of this is that it could happen again. The other extremely <sighs> shitty part about it is that they will fix his heart eventually, but it's such a risky surgery that they want to wait until it gets worse. So, cause they have to like, just imagine it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. inside your heart, like they're going to have to take everything yeah. out and just, and then there's high risk of stroke during the procedure. He'll be high risk for stroke three months after the procedure. So they're trying to like elongate it because it's so risky. I under, I understand why they want to wait. But that's the long-term shittiness of the situation. We got robbed. This is like my anger of it is that we got robbed so young in our marriage. We're 31, like with little kids, you don't expect this to be the yeah. conversation. At 31, I became his proxy. We had to go through all those shitty questions you know, do you want a DNR? What about life support? What about this? We had to have those super hard conversations. And that's what makes me so angry is we're living an older life very young. And then what makes me angry for him, he died. The person who John was died on the ninth when his brain got hit. He's not the same guy anymore. I'm still insanely love with him but everything's brand new we're relearning each other while also growing at the same time so we're facing like the basic struggles of just being you know cohabitating with people but then on top of it we're adding it's like a new person into the mix so that's with all of those like responsibilities and, right like Oh, this is a new person who you have children with, right? And like right. live with. And yeah, that's, and I mean, he's facing like trying to recover, also figuring out who he is while being a dad and a husband. Right. I mean, and, that's intense. Well, that's, you know, and that's a huge thing that helps me at the same time is anytime I get mad with him, 
I just play it in my head. Mm. I'm like, okay, like, he's an idiot, but he <laughs> had a stroke, and it's not his fault. Like, I'll get mad, and then I'll start saying it in my head, and I'm like, he's not an idiot. Like, yeah. He had a stroke. He can't help it. He has brain injury. And I'm like, okay, like, get back into peace with it. And it's like his short term is so bad that he'll have to put a chip clip on his shirt to remind himself he's cooking. Mm. Like he's been on medication for two years now, same time every day, still to this day, if you interrupt him on the way for him to get his medicine, he'll like space out on it. So it's that in itself is a lot of problem. And it's a problem for him because some people, when they have strokes now, don't <clears throat> misunderstand me. Cause it's going to sound awful. But some people are lucky enough when they have a stroke that it's severe enough that they don't remember the prior them. Mm. People with brain injury in general. John is stuck in a cage where he remembers who he used to be and cannot obtain it. Mm. So he's constantly fighting with himself over that. So that's a big thing we worked on. And a huge thing that his team gave to us, the sweet woman, Joanne, to give grace, give grace to yourself, give grace to each other, and just understand that we're in something that no one knows is what's going to happen. Like they've said that his brain hasn't officially settled into what it's going to settle into yet because everything's mm. still developing. And then lovely old COVID came and... We had to pull the kids out of school and um, we had to pull him out of therapy because oh he's, cause he's high risk. So all of a sudden now the kids are home full time. He's not going to therapy and I'm working crazy because for 15 months we had a fight for his disability. So mm -hmm. for 15 months, solo income. And then, oh, this makes me so mad. Solo income, kids and all that, but I was making too much money. So we weren't yep. getting help. And I'm like, what? <clears throat> like, tell me where the money is because I don't see it. Like, even now, I'm having to work crazy overtime because the state said that they were going to help us because we finally were vaccinated fully. So we want to put the kids back in school because they're suffering as well. Mm -hmm. John's not getting his break during the day because they're home. So put them in school because it's not, it's not a want. Everyone needs that. I need that so I can work. John needs that so his brain can start functioning better because he's regressed so much during this whole thing. And then the kids need it because they're kids. Like Parker's falling behind because she's not like her brothers. Like she doesn't just pick up the educational stuff. It's she's like me. It's, mm -hmm. she can get it, but she has to work really hard for it. And then on top of it, she's in speech and OT because her ears were all messed up. She had to get ear tubes. Um, cause she was completely like, she got double ear infections all the time. So we got her ear tube. She started hearing better, but then we started noticing that she kept like holding food and water in her mouth all the time. And I thought she was just being silly. So we took her back to the ENT for a follow-up and I was talk talking to him about like, he asked if she was snoring. I'm like, well, yeah, a little bit. And he goes, does she ever just hold food in her mouth? And I'm like, what a weird thing to ask. I'm like, yeah, she does it all the time. And he goes, it's cause her tonsils are so big. She can't swallow. I'm oh like, God, poor baby. Oh, I'm like, oh, and talk about feeling like a shit parent. You know what yeah. I mean? I was like, oh my God. So we got our tonsils and adenoids out New Year's Eve. So less than a year after her tubes. So she's in speech because that just messed her up. She wasn't a good communicator. Um, kids didn't want to play with her because they didn't understand her. So we're dealing with that. And then Ray is just like his auntie. And <laughs> yeah. he's very, very smart. And he's very sensory overload. And he has an awful time managing his feelings. Um, there's a lot of unexplained meltdowns mm -hmm. where something as simple as, hey, do you want your dinner right now? And he just flips out. 
And it's like, okay, like, we'll just, we'll just work through it. So anyway, that whole long story is because the school that they go to is attached to this therapy. So they just walk over and pick the kids up from class, bring them to therapy, and then bring them back. So that's another thing that we can take off our list, right? We don't have to worry about mm-hmm. getting to and from appointments. Their appointments aren't at the same time. So I take that off the plate. So when we got this all set up, our car decided to shit the bed. The engine gave uh, 6500 bucks to fix the engine. Girl, I don't have it. Um, <laughs> so we tried trading the car and our credit wasn't good enough to get into a new car. Uh So I had to go out and get a $2,000 loan to put down on an old used car. So I picked up another car payment, another insurance payment, and then on top of it, another loan payment. Um, So, but at least we have a car that runs now. It's safe for them. Um, But so when I started filing everything with the state, I was under the impression they'd be able to help me more. So they help with $67 a kid a week, which sounds great. No, it doesn't. Except for. <laughs> it sounds terrible. Yeah, it is horrible because it's 428 bucks a week after they've helped to get the kids there. And I found this out two weeks after they were in. So they've acclimated. They're Back to, you know, learning. Parker's doing so much better already with her writing and everything. And John's like, we can't do it. We can't afford it. I go, we can't, we can't take them out. It's not an option at this point. We kept them out of school for 16 months. We homeschooled them. Like, it's not an option anymore. They're having their friends again and this and that. I'm like, we just have to get through the summer. So, lucky enough, I work for Walmart now. And uh, I have proven to do a good job. So they are offering me overtime. Um, They let me come in whenever I want. I don't have to ask permission anymore. They just trust that I'm going to do what needs to get done, which to me is huge. Very validating for me to finally work for a company that's like, we trust you. I'm like, oh, okay. I like imagine that. Right. Right, Like, (laughs) I'm like, wow, this is not what I expected. So anyway, my life is a shit show. Um, I'm behind on rent, which is really scary. And even I worked almost 140 hours in two weeks and the paycheck is still not enough to get us caught up. So it's a lot of stress because we got his disability, but his disability isn't even enough to cover rent. Like it's like $400 off from paying rent. So, and then getting the kids in school, there was a $741 deposit. And then we had to pay for the first week and the second week. So they took like 1600 bucks out first go. So I'm really lucky to have an apartment manager that like knows us, knows our situation. She's very good to us. She's very good to the kids. And, um, she knows that I'm late, but she knows that I'm working my butt off to get her the money. But it doesn't change that being one of the biggest stressors is for two years, I haven't been able to financially breathe. Mm-hmm. There was a couple months. One of those is because you're the best ever. <laughs> um, but it just sucks because I started building a, that my business. I, you know, I do the resin and the jewelry and it, it made me so happy. I have my own little workshop, this and that. And I thought, you know, this is it. I'm finally going to get to just work part time and just start focusing on that. And then the universe just giggled at me and said, maybe not. (laughs) So that's where we're at. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, uh, it breaks my heart and it's like, I did an episode a really long time ago called the high cost of being poor. And I feel like this is almost a follow up to that because in it, we talked about like how being poor is just this fucking endless trap where 
people think you're like coasting like oh you get disability or you get whatever but it's like if you actually look at what's happening it's just this endless series of debts and late payments and interest rates and not actually getting any kind of substantial help like the fact mm -hmm. that john's disability doesn't cover what he would need to live doesn't make any sense right he's disabled he can't work so why should he not be receiving enough money to cover what it would take for him to survive but it doesn't and now look at your family and you have your own struggles and yet your entire focus and you've always just wanted to be a mom like for as long as i can remember you just have always wanted to be a mom like you're the yeah. type of person who loves being with their kids loves being home and for almost the entire time that you've been a mom you've just had to be out of the house and working constantly yeah. um to the point where like with parker you were having to breastfeed her on your lunch break from work right. or like on your breaks from work you'd have to run home from a shift and like breastfeed her and like run back and it just it, you know and it's also the stereotype that people have that poor people are lazy and that has always been so painful to me because i feel like our family in particular like none of us are lazy no dad who knows <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's the fucking <laughs> That's the whole thing. Um, <laughs> like, I'm tempted to call him lazy because he's a fucking asshole. But, but you know, like, if I'm being my compassionate self, like, he also has struggled with a lot of, like, health um, issues, you know, as long as he was our dad. He's had really bad allergies. I kind of wonder if he's autistic because he seems to have a lot of sensory stuff. So, I don't know, maybe who knows but like he always you know struggled with like being allergic to chemical scents and all of these things um mom always struggled as well but you know we were always like our parents were entrepreneurs they worked they had a business right. um you and i have always hustled i mean even angie like she's always hustled like we've always been a family of people who work really fucking hard and it just is so unfair that that's the perception of people who are financially struggling is that we're lazy and that right. we don't try. And I mean, t to be honest as well, like I think um, who fucking cares if someone's lazy? Like that doesn't mean that they should starve to death, you know? Right. Like I, I very much believe that. But it's just also like when you have hustled so hard and worked yourself into chronic illness and mental illness and you still can't make ends meet and the bills are still piling up and you're having to take out loans and stuff. And then you then you see that the public perception is that you must be either lazy and or irresponsible. Right. And like, I can't imagine anyone more responsible than you, you know, like you somehow are holding this household together and you always have like, you've always been such a good mom, like such a dedicated mom, such a dedicated wife, um, such a good worker. Like you're like the hardest worker ever. And yeah. And then that's, that's what the narrative is out there is that like people who need public assistance are fucking lazy and irresponsible and you know we're just like a drain on society right. big warning for this let's have a real moment and i'm sorry if i get emotional but if i can give this piece of advice for anybody being a caregiver never make a promise that's gonna hurt you mentally huh. so like i said before john was never scared of death but when we were in the second hospital, it was nighttime and he was refusing to sleep. I'm like, honey, you gotta get sleep. You gotta get some rest. And he started crying and I'm like, what's wrong? And he's like, I'm scared if I close my eyes, I won't wake up again. So, and this is where I'm giving the advice. I made the stupid promise that I would watch over him and make sure he was okay. I didn't sleep for months after he came home because every move every weird breath cough moan groan anything 
had me up and worried because now we have this thing looming over our heads. He can have another one, you know, obviously he's on blood thinners and everything to help accommodate for that. But this was a freak stroke in the first place. It was against all odds that it would happen. So not to say it'll happen again. So I will give that advice because I had no fucking clue what I was doing in the beginning of this as I wouldn't expect anyone in this situation. Do not make any kind of promise that's going to screw you up mentally because mentally that screwed me up bad. I promised to watch him and protect him. And at the time I just meant while we were there, right? I can watch the machine and make sure you're okay. I can press a button if something happens. Like obviously the nurse's station is, you know, checking in on him, but I didn't expect it to affect me going home. And that's exactly what it did. And it followed me home and it screwed me up. Also, don't let people judge you on shit. Like you gotta do what's right for you and your situation. Like I'm part of a stroke caregiver group and there are people on there that's like, you know what, I'm really sorry, but I cannot do this anymore. I cannot take care of my person anymore because some people get real aggressive after brain injury. Some Mm -hmm. people get really violent and there's no judgment to that. You got to do what you got to do. And the thing I hate the most is no one wants to talk about the gross nitty gritty specifics of the heaviness of this situation, right? No one wants to sit and talk about, Hey, John lost a shitload of our 23 years worth of memory. Like, he started calling Keegan his stepson after his stroke. And we both know Keegan has always just been his son. Yeah. Like, all these big... Oh, that's heartbreaking. It's awful. It's absolutely (sighs) awful. And, you know, he forgot stuff from our wedding. He forgot stuff from when we were kids. He's forgotten books that we used to read every night to the kids. All these things that, you know, you feel... That make a life, right? That help you feel connected to the people you have to be connected to. Right. And so for him, there's no emotional attachment to it because he doesn't know to miss it because he doesn't have a link. Right. Mm -hmm. So for him, the hard part is watching me react to it. Yeah. Like you ever heard of a Kara Kara orange? Yeah. Oh my God. I love them. Okay. so (laughs) So when I was pregnant with Raylan and Parker, both times, um, he got pregnancy cravings. He was that guy. <laughs> he would so like cute. text me when I was at work. Can you, can you get a chocolate shake and fries from McDonald's? I'm like, who's pregnant? Right. Like, who? <laughs> so one of the things he loved was Care Care Oranges. Cause when I was pregnant with Ray, I worked at Trader Joe's. Um, so I used to bring home Care Care Oranges for him and Walmart had them one day and I'm like, babe, they have Care Care Oranges. And he was like, okay. I'm like, oh no, like it's gone. It's just gone. And he looked at me, he goes, I can tell that this is obviously a problem. And I'm like, it's all right. It's okay. Cause I don't want to make him feel bad. Cause it's not yeah. his fault. <clears throat> so it's really complicated um, in that. So what frustrates me with people is they don't want to talk about that, right? It's uncomfortable, uh-huh. but for some reason people feel emboldened to ask. And I fucking hate this question. Have you ever thought of not being with him? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you don't want to talk about the relationship, but you want to talk about me leaving it. Yeah. Because then they don't have to feel bad about what you're going through. Cause then you won't be going through it. Right. Right. And I'm like, what? Takes care of the issue. (laughs) So one time I got really mad at someone (laughs) cause I just don't, I didn't like the judgment cause they were very judgy about the whole situation. Yeah. And they're married. Right. And they're like, well, if it were me or my wife, if we didn't push each other harder, first off, he accused me of not pushing John enough. And I'm like, mm, hmm, hmm. okay, I'll take it. And then proceeded that if it was him or his wife, if the other one didn't give enough effort, they would leave each other. Wow. I'm like, okay, you've never been through this. You don't understand brain injury. You have no empathy to it. So I just straight up looked at him and I go, you know what? I am so sorry for you that your love and your relationship is so fucking weak and fragile (laughs) that you wouldn't make it through this. Yeah. Like this is my chance. If I didn't want to be with my husband, I wouldn't be with him. 
but I want to be with him. And it's on his side too. All of a sudden, he's a sensory overload dude who can't drive in traffic. He can't order through a drive through He can't order on the phone. He can't have two people talking to him at the same time. He doesn't remember shit. I can't tell you how many cups of coffee got left in the coffee, like the Keurig, because he just spaced. Mm-hmm. You know, all this stuff are like, I'll look at him and he's like, I forgot to do something. I'm like, it's okay. Like, we got it. So for someone to just be like, you can leave him. I'm like, no. But I offered to John multiple times. If this is too much for you, we can figure out how for you to get your own apartment. Or yeah. like you to move in with your parents. Like if you just need some time away from us while you're healing, we can do that. If we're too much for you now, as much as that breaks my heart, you have the freedom to do that. And that's the other thing about caregiving is it's not just about the person you're caregiving about. And it's not just about you. There's got to be a dance and a fluctuation because I sucked at it in the beginning. Like I, I told you, like I just recently finally got insurance again and I called my doctor and I'm like, I need help. I need help. I'm like fucking lost in the sauce. I'm depressed. Like I wasn't suicidal, but I felt so much unworthiness Um, and it was because I wasn't producing serotonin because well of course I know why my situation I've been like this for two years there's no space for happiness in that so they put me back on Zoloft and that rocked my system in the beginning I was really sick for a couple weeks but I noticed I was all of a sudden I could sleep All of a sudden, I could stay asleep. All of a sudden, I was giggling. I was on the floor more. Um, Since I've been on Zoloft, the use of my phone has gone down 48%. Wow. Like, I'm just involved. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy. And I'm laughing again. And, you know, John keeps telling me that I'm more playful again. So it's not just him that got fucked up. I got fucked up. And we got messed up together and separately. And... You know, he doesn't remember what my favorite food is. He doesn't remember what my favorite candy is. And to me, as long as he can still make me laugh, and when I see him, I get that little bubbly, gurgly feeling on the inside. And, you know, when he gives me a kiss, I'm like, ooh. Like, you know, he still brings everything I fell in love with is still there. It's just different Hmm. and getting through the difference is the hard part. There's a lot of hard, awful conversations that neither one of us want to have. It's brutal to talk to him. Like um, he has this insane overprotection of the kids now, like stupidly insane. Like don't run in the muddy grass with your shoes because you're going to ruin your shoes. I'm like, Uh. babe. Like they're going to grow out of him in two months. Just let them, just let them be kids. He has a hard time letting them be kids because, and this is the worst part is he realized that he can't protect them from everything. Yeah. Having a stroke made him realize that he, imagine how powerless, like I feel powerless in this situation, but imagine how literally powerless he must feel. Absolutely. he always tries to play it off like he's cool with it. He he gets it. He understands it. He always tells me, babe, you can't worry about it all the time. I'm like. <laughs> You're like, um. Like, okay, when I figure out how to do that, I'll do that. It's like that stupid anxiety meme. Like I told, my fr- <laughs> I told one of my friends that I'm anxious and they said, oh, just don't be. And I'm like, oh, thanks for fixing it. Like just <laughs> yeah, that. I'll better now. <laughs> oh, you want me to not worry about it? Got it. Cool. Awesome. Again, why didn't I think of that? It's so (laughs) obvious. Right. And so I, (sighs) you know, bless him, but it's just like the, the weirdest stuff bothers him. Like I have to ask him if I can hug him because his skin got really sensitive after, um, he can't stand being in the ocean because it hurts his skin. Like that extreme coldness hurts him. Like just so different and like it took him a long time he's finally writing music again which is like a gigantic deal because he lost it um from his his left side being so weak 
So there's, there's definitely progress, but it's like, he doesn't understand how to borrow when you do simple subtraction. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't understand the concept of carrying over. So math was never his strong suit in the first place, but it's certainly not there now. So it's just rough. It's just really rough because he's still really monotone. Um, he sounds like an ass a lot. Like he knows that. He sounds like I'll ask him like six times a day, like, you all right? And he's like, yeah, why? And I'm like, because you, you, you sound unhappy. <laughs> like I call, I'll call him on the phone and he's like, hey, I'm like, is this mm. a bad time? And he's like, no, I'm just sitting drinking coffee. And I'm like, okay, so we're good. <laughs> like, we're all right. So it's It's hard. It's super hard. And it's hard for him because he has no idea. He has no idea how to put it together. It knocked um, his empathy and his sympathy and his tone. Um, It knocked him being able to like register if we're looking at each other, having a conversation like those physical social cues. He doesn't have them. And he's like really ironic with stuff like Raylan will want to tell him a story but he already knows what Raylan's trying to tell him about. So he'll like tell Raylan, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you got to let him finish talking. And he goes, but I already know. And I go, right. And who else does that? (laughs) Who else over explains things all the time? And he's like, you like, no, (laughs) like he literally spent an hour and a half telling me about like 30 minutes of gameplay of call of duty with his friends. He's basically autistic now. Basically. That's like all like autistic traits. Right. And Ray's just like him without having had a stroke. So yeah. wow. I also um because I've I've asked his therapist, Raylan's therapist, I'm like, can we like check to see if he's Asperger's? Because I'm convinced. And she's like, Well, I'm used to seeing more extreme forms. I'm like, oh, I understand that, but he can't wear jeans, he can't have tags, his food can't touch. Everything has to be just so, or it's all hell breaks loose. Like, and I'm not talking about fits. I got kids. I know what a fit is. I'm talking about full blown meltdowns where he screams, Mm -hmm. he claws at himself. He bruises himself all the time. I'm like, you got to stop hurting yourself. Like you want to be mad, be mad. Mad is fine. Hurting yourself and being mean, not okay. Like, so it's hard because I'm doing it with them at the same time. Yeah, because John slips in and out of where his brain is. Sometimes it's like arguing with another kid. Um, He's really defiant like a teenager now. Like I can see him like he turns red when he starts getting overdone. And I'm like, why don't you go take a break in the room? He goes, you don't tell me what to do. Okay. Uh, Is he like, I "I hate you. Yeah. (laughs) Slam the door. Oh, he's done it. He's literally stomped off. Slam the door and I went into the room and he's on the bed like this and I'm like <laughs> you're like really he's like, he's like well you sent me off to my room and I'm like are you I'm like I can't even with you right now and he's like what I'm like you get the luxury of going into a quiet room by yourself and doing whatever the hell you want for a, however long you want don't be throwing a fit you ground me anytime you want if this is my deal like enough and he just he's struggles with his ego now which was just never a thing and he's like very stereotypical manly now like i hate to use such a broad term but just like what you would expect as a stereotype Mm -hmm. when thinking of him and that was so hard because i'm like i miss my feminine aspect of my partner um and then also, I got really mad at myself after his stroke because I realized how much I let myself depend on him, which I have never let myself depend on someone as much as him. Like, even to the point that I didn't know how to put the car seats back together. Like, we were cleaning the car seats out the night before he had a stroke, and they were apart in pieces, and I cried for like 30 minutes because I couldn't get them together. And then he was trying to help me. Like, this was after we got back from the hospital he's trying to help me and his hand's not working and he's upset and frustrated and I'm like how could I ever let myself get into a situation that if he had not made it I would have no clue what to fucking do right now and that's been my biggest struggle is letting him back in because now all my walls are up 
because I realized that I made myself unhealthily labeling myself as a weak person for giving my heart to someone, which in reality, I should have celebrated it. What a beautiful thing that someone coming from our past let someone (laughs) in enough. And instead I'm like, yeah, idiot, this is exactly why you're not supposed to let people in. And then I heard the great voice of you only can depend on yourself. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, hmm. Mm. So that was really tough. And then, you know, it's really tough for him because he feels like a failure a lot because I'm working so much. But then he's... Which was already kind of like a sore point in your relationship. And now it must just be... Yeah, really grinded in there. So yeah, yeah, so I've always been the breadwinner, which is okay. Like I was bred for it. And... You know, it's been me working 80 hours a week pretty much since he's had a stroke. And, you know, it's it's tough because sometimes he gets really angry. Again, no emotional regulation. And, you know, he gets accusatory sometimes of how I want to be at work more than I want to be home. And I'm like, okay, well, we both know that's not right. Like, we both know I just want to be here. Yeah. Um, but lately he's gotten better about it. Um, like he'll randomly send me a text message saying that he's really proud of me. Aww. And then he's finally admitted. I go, babe, if we were in a reverse role, you'd be doing the same thing. He goes, Gina, I could never work the way you work. He goes, I'm just not capable of it. Yeah. And I'm like, well, thank you. I like, think that's I, true. <laughs> I think it's true too. I mean, like, I think most people couldn't work the way you work. Like, Yeah. Right. But, and the way I see it is because like here now I've got, because I used to work at Walmart when we first moved back here. So I know a lot of people here already. So they all know us and they love us and everybody is nosy at the time clock. Oh, you're leaving already? And I'm like, I'm going on my second lunch. And they're like, oh, well, how long have you been here? And I'm like, "Mm." like one night I got here at 10 o'clock at night. And I stayed till like one o'clock the next day. And they're like, you can't overdo it. I'm like, I don't think you understand. Like, this isn't like me wanting a tattoo. So I'm working like crazy, which I wish I could get one or my hair done. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, (laughs) it's not fun. It's because I have to. And people tend to ask a lot, like, well, how do you do it? And I go, here's the thing. Asking how I can do it is a luxury I don't have. There is no other option. We don't have anybody who can help us. We're financially stripped, you know, like mom's tried to help us. Like she'll give me 50 bucks once in a while to like, just help me like pad through the week, which is amazing. I I, I always tell her, don't send me anything if it's going to put you out because I don't want to put you out either. So, you know, oh, the other thing was we had food stamps for a little while and then um, they took it away and didn't tell me. So we went from having $600 for groceries to nothing and no one gave me the heads up. So like that's coming back into the budget. So it's just so frustrating because it's not an option. The, what motivates me to keep me going is my kids need their education. My husband needs his breaks. We need to pay for these cars. We need to live in our house. They need clothes on their back and food in their bellies. And if I have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I will find a way to do it because that's, there's no other option. There's no backup plan. If there was another option, I would have already done it. Mm -hmm. I would have already gone down that avenue. And so I understand people say it with love, like, hey, don't burn yourself out. And it's like, you have no idea. Like if I did a 64 hour week, I could have done a whole nother shift, but they won't let me work seven days in a row. Like I will grind as hard as I have to grind to make it happen because it has to happen. Cause if I don't do it, there's no one else to fall back on. So I just want to give props to anybody who has to go through that situation because it fucking sucks. It's endless. It's suffocating at times. And I always say it's like juggling. Mm-hmm. I have all these balls up in the air and not an answer for a single one of them. Ugh, girl. And so I know you're not a big Silver's Linings person. See, no. I listen. I listen. <laughs> I listen to your podcast. Um, I know. 
but I am that person. I am that I obnoxious you person. <laughs> um, because and I, lo- I love that for you. <laughs> yeah, well, for me. <laughs> it works for me. But that's the difference uh-huh. is, it, is it works for me is if I'm like, hey, silver lining is I can go in at 10 o'clock at night and my children won't miss me because they're sleeping. And they're in school for the rest of my shift. So, like, by the time I'm eating my second lunch, they're eating their breakfast. So, at least there's that. They don't have that ache of yeah. seeing me leave out the door like they did when I worked at Outback. And, you know, so I'm like, there's my silver lining. I get to come in in the middle of the night and just <laughs> die on the other side of the day. Um, <laughs> woohoo! Woohoo! Um, <laughs> And also, they let me work in the freezer, which has been great for my fibro. I have fibromyalgia. I didn't put that out there. Um, So it's like getting a giant ice pack on my whole body. And then I go to the floor to put the stuff out, and then I warm up, and then I go back in the freezer. So all day, it's like a hot, cold pack day. Um, And it's the first job I've worked in six years where I don't leave limping. That's really good. So there's that. And it's instantly gratifying because I take boxes out of a bin. I fill holes on the floor. And then when I come back, there's all these holes in the boxes. I'm like, yes, like you get to see the cardboard stack up. And for some reason that mentally is just like really peaceful and hopeful. Yeah. So in recap, (laughs) when you're a caregiver, it's okay to be mad. I wouldn't be mad with the person you're caring for I would find a safe place to vent that out because I promise you when you are a caregiver and you let it out on the person you're taking care of you feel like a piece of shit after because you hear yourself talk it out to them and that's really hard now I'm not saying that there aren't times to have stern conversations or real conversations or be able to go hey you're making me mad right now and I can't do this with you. Cause like, um, I have another friend, she got into a nasty car accident. She has a, she had a really bad brain injury and it changed her. Mm-hmm. And we we're discussing like, it's very common in brain injury that you can't have immediate conversation. So with John, I'll say something to him, but I got to give him a few days to like mull it over. Um, Our best form of communication is journals and texting Mm. because it gives them time to work it out. And like, we've literally texted each other from opposite rooms to like have a conversation. And does that suck? Absolutely. Do I miss being able to have like a on time conversation with him? Yes. But you got to make sacrifices in that and making sure that the person you're taking care of has the best way to communicate. Cause if you try to push them to communicate in a way that they're not capable of, you're just going to hurt them and you're yeah. going to make them feel bad. And I'm not saying that your needs don't need to be met, but everything does need to be heavily assessed and, and understood. Does it suck to not have a conversation live? Yes. But does that hurt me? No, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Does it hurt him? Yes. So, mm-hmm. The sacrifice, like that assessment is, hey, communicate the way that works for him because he has more time to really think about what he's going to say because he gets really defensive and short because it burns him out and then he just gets mad. And it's like he says things that he doesn't mean. And then he has to like try to remember that. And also people with brain injury, when they're overstimulated in an emotional sense, the memory gets corrupted. So they won't remember what happened, but they'll remember how they felt and that will change the dynamic of the conversation. So that's happened with me and John before where he got really mad in the conversation, really upset, which granted, you know what I mean? Like he was entitled to have those feelings, but it twisted what I was trying to say to him because I was trying Mm -hmm. to explain to him that it's okay. And like him being newer is okay. And, him going through this is okay. And, you know, we're so lucky he's alive and we just got to work on these things. You know, like he's really strict on the kids. He's really rough on the kids. And he's like, well, fine. Then I'm just an asshole. Then I'm like, Whoa, that's not what we're talking about right now. But he remembered feeling that. 
So yeah. that corrupted the whole conversation. He remembers that is that happening. And like, I'll talk to him. <laughs> Apparently it's party time. <laughs> All right, well, let me mute myself. I don't know what is going on over there. <laughs> but so it's just that whole, you have to assess. Of course, there needs to be healthy boundaries. I'm not saying for anybody to just take copious amounts of crap. If they're a ca mm -hmm. caregiver, like that's not at all what I'm saying. That's not healthy either. But um, you have to be able to step away and look at it and go, okay, if I were this person, how would I handle that? Or, you know, does this hurt me? Does this affect me negatively? Is this just a nuisance? If it's just a nuisance, you got to get over it. Like he can't handle grocery shopping even before COVID. The lights, the sounds, <laughs> yeah. the people, he can't yeah. remember what the fuck he's getting. Oh my God. Our Walmart redid the Walmart on the inside. Like they remodded everything. I had to leave work to pick him up because he was crying because he had no idea what Aww. was happening. So That's stuff so like sad. that. Do I want to go grocery shopping every time? Hell no. no. <clears throat> but does it hurt me? No. It's just stupid. I usually listen to music. But like, and the other thing it, on the opposite side of that is I struggled a lot with making it okay to feel how I felt too. In that extreme yeah. of I'm a very anxious person. I'm high anxiety. Um, I hate crowds. Um, I'm dyslexic. And for a long time, I thought I was losing my hearing because I have a hard time hearing people. So I went and got that tested. And it's actually with my dyslexia, something flipped in my brain where I can't isolate noise. I struggle with that too, actually. Yeah. Yes. So everything yeah. comes in at once. There's no filtering. Yeah. So when I'm Does it make you angry? I get like, well, I get nauseous and sometimes I get extremely angry. Like, um, there's certain plate bars here. I can't go to because the way they're built, the sound, like all of the sound in the restaurant comes at you at the same time. And it'll make me feel like I'm going to pass out. It makes me anxious. It makes me angry. <laughs> yeah. It makes me, it makes me feel like shutting down. Like when I'm at work mm -hmm. and I'm on the floor, they let us have an earbud in and I have to have it in. So I have that one thing to focus on Yeah. because otherwise I'm just overwhelmed Yeah. and everything seems to get brighter. And I was like, well, I is there anything? I always have earbuds in all the time because it just helps like, right. yeah, focus. And so I struggled with that for a long time of, Hey, you know, like John used to drive everywhere. Mm. He was comfortable driving. I don't like driving, but now I'm the full-time driver. And like the first time I had to pick Keegan up from Logan, I'm like, uh, driving into Boston. I'm like, fuck. Like, oh I don't, God. I don't ever do it. John was always the one to pick him up. And Logan airport is literally, I can say this cause I've traveled a lot <laughs> for work. The worst airport on the face of the planet. It's so oh, bad. It's so bad. And then on top of it's it, it's the says, only airport that I'll like actively get lost in and be like, where literally where the fuck am I? And how do I get out of here? No idea. Anytime I go, no idea. And since Keegan, my oldest son, sorry, I keep assuming you guys all know about my life, but you don't. <laughs> um, I have an oldest son. He's 10 and he lives in California with my ex-husband for the school year. Who's a fucking bastard. Oh God. That's a whole nother podcast for a yeah. whole nother time. <laughs> yeah. When to get out. The answer yeah. is before you pee on the stick. Anyway, um, so. <laughs> Girl. Sorry. Well, and that's also another great class oriented story of like what money can do, right? Right. And yeah. that's exactly anyway. what happened. Anyway, so Keegan likes to fly alone because they pamper the shit out of him, you know? Mm -hmm. He gets free blankies and pins. He gets to go into the cockpit, meet the pilot. Like, it's Keegan. He's got charm. So the <laughs> shitty part about picking him up from the airport is you have to park. Then you have to go uh, in, and you have to get a ticket to go pick him up and wait. And then I'm getting, like, secondary stress. Like, I'm getting, yeah. like, sweaty thinking about it. 
Yeah, I'm doing this Thursday, by the way. Woohoo! Oh. Um, so, <laughs> but I'm the sorry, worst part sister. is when he goes back, since he's underage, you have to bring him in at least two hours early, and then you have to sit with him, stay with him, and you have to sit and wait there till the airplane is in flight, like off the runway. Wow. So on top of having to drive into Boston, which sucks, and going to the airport, which sucks, you have to pay for the parking, which is ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. It's, but anyway. How much is that? It must be like a million dollars. I think the last time I went, and this, keep in mind, I haven't seen Keegan. By the time I pick him up, it'll have been 522 days since I've seen him because wow. of COVID. Oh, yeah. dude. Co well, he's living with his grandparents right now, and they're all high risk. So now that yeah. there's the vaccine, we're all vaccinated. So anyway, so it's been a long time. So the last time I went, I want to say it cost me like $42. So I can't imagine what it's going to cost now. Yeah. Probably a lot. Yeah. But, you know, and I just think um, I'm glad you talked about how it's both of you choosing each other and your family and working through that, you know, because they think there's so many layers here, right? Like you could feel that you have to stay because he needs help and he could feel that he has to stay because he needs help, you know, right. or feeling like guilty about leaving the family or whatever. So um, something I talk a lot about is how people who are disadvantaged, I guess we'll say in some way are often in infantilized, you know, like people make us out to be like children and you know that happens to disabled people all the time and so i just really like that you talked about like the fact that you two are talking about this stuff and you're making conscious decisions and life choices for yourself and like even though he is so high need right now he still is like choosing to be in his life and he's choosing what that looks like and i think that's really important because i think when especially when you get into brain stuff in any kind of way, but really any disability. I think people just assume that the disabled person just has a caretaker who just makes all the decisions for them. And um, it's really important that we remember that no matter how disabled someone is, like they should still always have an active role in their own life and in making decisions about their own life. Absolutely. And another thing is letting the person you're caring for make their rules. Yes. Like, yes. Cause I helicoptered and like umbrellaed a lot in the beginning over him. I was very, very protective for obvious reasons. Um, and I went with him to all of his therapies. And then one day he was in a very like defiant, stubborn attitude of, he felt like that made him inferior. So he challenged me about how he could do it his damn self <laughs> and go to the appointment by himself. And I said, okay, I'll wait in the car. That's fine. Like, I'll go get a coffee or something. I'll, I'll be back. He got in the car and I'm like, so how did it go? Like legitimately, maybe I am, you know, overbearing. Like I get it. I can be extremely overbearing, especially when I love someone. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> he was like, uh, never leave me again. Like, it was just, like, that sad. And, like, when he first got out of the hospital, he used to grab my shirt like this all the time when he was overwhelmed. Um, he can't go into Trader Joe's or Market Basket. It's way too much for him. That's always a shutdown. Um, anything that's busy is too much for him. Any extreme weather is too much for him. And, like, it breaks my heart because he gets all these big ideas. And then I have to kind of reel him in from it and, like, mm. talk it out. So he makes a choice whether... Because it's up to him if it's worth it or not, right? Yeah. Like, I love that you talk about spoons. I love spoons. I hope mm -hmm. to one day get my tattoo of my bouquet of spoons. I love spoons. So, does he have the spoons for it? Like, is it worth it for you to overspend on that day? If it is, let's do it. Like, I will do anything you want in the world if we can get you there, right? So, he wanted to go to a ghost concert. It's like his mm. favorite band. And it was the last band we saw before his stroke. And I'm like, okay. I go, but let's talk it out. It's going to be really loud. There's yeah. going to be a lot of people and they're going to be touching you. It's going to be unavoidable. 
there's going to be strobing lights, loud music, and it's going to be like a three hour show. I go with now you thinking about that information. What do you think? And he sat and he thought about it. He goes, you're right. He goes, especially because the drive down was going to be long too. Cause it was in, yeah. it was in Boston. I'm like, so you got to weigh it out. And how many days after that are you going to be knocked down? How tired are you going to be with your brain? How, at what point of the show are you going to stop enjoying it? And it's going to become a problem. I go, but if you want to do it, let's do it. Like I, I would love to go do that with you. Um, what was I going to say? Well, I just, I, I really like you talking about that because I feel like, like your process with John and what you and he both have to go through when he has an idea about something, because I have come to realize that that's basically my own process with myself as well, but it took a really long time to figure out that that's what I needed to do because I had so many scripts in my head for how productive I should be able to be and what I should be able to do. And when I would suffer the repercussions of something like, like I also really enjoy live music, but it's very challenging, right? right. It's, it's a very taxing event. I love travel, but that's incredibly like taxing and I pay a massive toll for that. So when I would suffer those, those consequences, I hate calling them that, but you know, we'll just put it that way. Um, I would just blame myself and I would be like, you're so weak. Like, what is your problem? Why are you so tired from this? This is something that other people go and do all the time and like have no issues. And eventually I just had to be like, well, that may be true, but this is what's true for you. You know, right. like you can be as mad about it as you want to be, but it's still going to be your lived experience. So maybe right. instead of putting all that energy into being mad, you just put that energy into dealing with the reality of your situation and being more um, intentional about the choices you're making and being like, like I've learned I have to be my own caregiver and I have to look at myself through that lens. And that was really hard for me because I didn't want to be someone who needed care. Right. You know? Well, look at the way we were raised. We were meant to not, which oh, yeah. was hugely eye opening for me with how I felt about the whole experience. And here I am giving him everything, telling him whatever you need, I'm here for mm -hmm. it while telling myself, you idiot. How yeah, dare like, you? Why do you what? have any needs? Right. And so, you know, you, and that's when it comes back to that lady saying, give yourself grace, give him grace, give each other grace. And it's so true is don't be comparative. And that's what, and don't get me wrong. I'm not like all of a sudden this guru that gets it, but it's stuff that I've, <laughs> I've, you know, I intentionally work on all the time is my experience is mine. And it doesn't mean that I'm weaker or stronger or anything. My experience is my experience. Your experience is yours. And to try to sit and scale them yeah. is just <laughs> asinine. And it needs to stop. I could go running. And the way I feel after running can be different than your experience. But we both ran, right? Yeah. So it's not fair to compare them. And I just don't understand why there is that, that part of my competitiveness I've tried letting go of is it's not who's worse or worse off. You know what I mean? Like I've got a yeah. coworker, her husband caught COVID and he's been fighting for his life for three weeks in the hospital now. And they still don't know if he's going to make it. That sucks. But she never looks at me and goes, well, what you're going through is nothing compared to what I'm going through. She still makes the time to ask me about it. And I make yeah. time to ask about her. And like, it's just one of those like really mind opening moments of you can't compare your trauma in a measurement against someone else's and vice versa. Everybody goes through trauma and the way they feel is no less. There's no reason to ever objectify someone were feeling away. Oh, that's what you're worried about. Well, I have this way to invalidate everyone. Yeah. Shut up. You're all going through <laughs> trauma. Come into it together. Just because someone's trauma is different does not mean it affects them less. Yeah. 
And so that was like a really big slap in the face. Because when I worked for Outback, it was like some bullshit, nasty drama restaurant life. And I know. Um, by the time I left, I was assistant kitchen manager. So I would do clopins. So clo- open to closes. Ugh. Awful. And then open to close, open to close. And, you know, there was no real management in there. So everybody got to talk whatever way they wanted to talk. I'd be like, hey can you guys just please bring the vent hoods down for me and I'll clean them, put them back up. I'm not fucking doing that. I'm like, what? And it was okay. It was accepted. And so I got into that, like I fed into that nastiness cause it was my mm-hmm. life. And I just remember like a kid was complaining about being tired and I go, well, you don't even have fucking kids. It's your own damn fault. And I'm like, who was that? Like, yeah, who talks <laughs> like that? And so, um, it's just, you got to remember, you got to be able to self-check yourself a lot and have people in your life that can kind of help you do it. And that's, I know can be really hard and sometimes impossible to achieve. Like I should definitely be in counseling, but I don't have time for that right now. And that's the legitimate truth is I don't have time to put aside for that. And if I do the sacrifices, my time with my kids, and that seems more depressing to me than just kind of getting through how I'm getting through right now. So don't judge people with brain injury. Understand that it's invisible. Understand you can't see it. And invalidating someone with a brain injury is so devastating because I've seen people do it to John over and over again, including his own family, you know, because they love him. They're just very different from how we were raised and you know like i warned everybody before the first time they saw him out of the hospital hey he doesn't like being touched and he got hugged for literally seven and a half minutes and i'm like and they you know they think i'm overreacting and that i'm being too sensitive because john doesn't want to tell him how bad it is so he never tells them how bad it is so i look like this crazy overbearing person i'm like I'm like, why don't you just talk to him? He goes, because I don't want my family to worry. I'm like, but they're your family. Like, they're there to worry. And that's just not how his family is. They all do that in their own way of trying to protect one another. Mm Because they don't want, they respect the fact that everybody has their own shit. And they don't want to add on to it. And I'm like, but no, your family, like, you're supposed to share your shit. So you can all carry it together. So it's not so heavy. So everything just feels really heavy. And, um, I'm not bubbly all the time, but I'm more bubbly now because I've, you know, work sucks. So I fix that. My mental health sucks. So I'm working on that. Um, I'm tired and I don't think that's ever going to go away, Uh. but you know, I have to keep thinking that one day it'll all be worth it. Cause if I think it's going to stay like this forever, I'm just going to. Yeah, lose, lose it. it. Yeah. yeah, and so um, I'm really hopeful that my money situation is um, caught up if I keep working brutal hours and that I can keep paying a ridiculous amount for childcare because that's what everyone needs. And I hope that this was helpful for anybody listening. If I helped at least one person understand, hey, you're not alone and it sucks, or hey, be nice to that person. Um, I'll feel like this was a huge success because I know I'm really talkative, but, um, (laughs) I'm really private. So this was really, really out of my norm. Well, I appreciate it. I'm quite honored to have you here on my platform regardless, because you're my sister and I love you. I love Um, you too. But especially to talk about, yeah, something so personal and I think something so important because I really do feel like your experience is at the intersection of so many things that, you know, it's like capitalist um, values that we have because those feed into like ableism and um, classism, you know, there's just this this real lived experience of your life that right. just highlights so many things that are faults of the system, but are put like 
promoted as faults of the individual and and just you know like i think I don't know, just to me, again, you're just such a good example of, like, I don't think that you should have to work a lot to be valued, but you're just such a good example of someone who works so fucking much and, like, tries so hard, and so none of this is a fault of, like, you not working your ass off. It's It just shows that the system is completely fucked up. Right. You know, I, I want to publicly thank you for being here and talking about your experience. And I think you just brought up so many really important things um, for us to think about. But also, I just, you know, really appreciate you sharing your story just as like understanding someone's lived experience, you know. Well, thank you. It was so a lot of fun. You. Yeah. All right, kids, uh, we're going to sign off now. Thank you for tuning in. And I will be back in two weeks with another sex stream where Maureen and her colleague Mike are going to come on to answer questions about sex that they've gotten from high school students that they teach. So these are real questions that kids have asked about sex, and we're going to go through them all and give our answers. I'm really excited about it. So we will see y'all then. Bye. Thank you for watching today. If you'd like to make a donation to help Gina out in her financial situation, you can do so by using the Venmo and PayPal links below. Just make sure to include for Gina in the note or memo on the payment, and I'll make sure that she gets that money directly. If you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, click the bell for notifications. You know what to do. Leave me a comment below, either a comment or your favorite emoji. Also, if you enjoyed this video today, please go to patreon.com slash pink spots in order to get access to the after party playlist. The after party includes outtakes that didn't make it into the final cut, as well as additional conversation that me and my guests have in a more relaxed atmosphere after the formal main topic is over. A big thank you as always to my Patreon donors. Your donations help this disabled queer anarchist live a self-directed independent life and that's pretty damn cool. Thank you so much for tuning in today and we will see you on the next one.